Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lenses and Data Modeling with Donna Burbank. And just to let everybody know, we will be continuing this series, although we will be broadening the topic to and changing the name of it to Data Architecture Strategies next year. But also it will remain on the fourth Thursday of each month with the exception of November and December where it kind of mixes in the holidays. We got these special times for December. Um, uh, but same fourth Thursday of each month with Donna. It'll continue with Donna, so we're very excited about that. But today, Donna's going to be discussing data modeling, data governance, and data quality. And today is sponsored by Altrix. Thanks for helping make today's webinar happen. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. And for questions, you'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag LessonsDM. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today. First, the speaker of this series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the managing director or the man of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And joining Donna this month is her colleague, Nigel Turner. Nigel is the principal consultant in EMEA at Global Data Strategy. He specializes in information strategy, data governance, data quality, and master data management. With more than 20 years of experience in the information management industry, Nigel started his career working to improve data quality, data governance, and CRM with British Telecom, and has since used his experience to help over 150 other organizations to do the same. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna and Nigel to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to do these. Um, and jumping right in, as uh, Shannon mentioned, this is sort of the final tier in our eye session uh, for the data modeling series. The good news is if you met, missed any of the ones in the past, they are, as Shannon mentioned, all out on demand on the Dataversity website. So you'll see we had a, a very varied list of topics from enterprise architecture to BI, et cetera, et cetera. So those live out there, I think, in perpetuity. So if you miss them, um, you can always catch them um, on demand. So coming up next year, we're really excited again to we try to really mix up the list of topics from everything we're hearing you guys talk about, uh, from data strategy, pure data strategy, to metadata, to graph databases, which was really popular last year, uh, to data lakes, et cetera, et cetera. We're also throwing in a few panels um, so uh, we can have sort of some of the other thought leaders in the industry um, really talk about their, their thoughts on trends, et cetera. Uh, that will be up shortly on the Dataversity site, so you can register for those um, coming up next year. We hope you can join us. Um, so jumping right into what we're going to cover today, uh, a whole laundry list of things that are separate but related. So everyone, I think, is familiar with data governance being that sort of people process and policies around data. Uh, but for those technical folks in the call, you know you can't do that without the technical infrastructure. And so I often get the question, what is data governance? Is it a technical um, thing or is it a business, you know, people process thing? And I give the lovely consultant answer of yes. Um, but it really is. It's both, um, and that's trying to get that link between business definitions and technical data systems, that's sort of the crux of giving data governance teeth. <laughs> so we're going to talk a lot about that, of how data models and data governance strategies can really help with that. Um, but really, what even adds more complexity in the mix is, especially when we're talking about folks like the sponsor with Alteryx, is the idea of data prep, of self-service data prep and analytics, and it isn't just data architects doing things. So how do we keep um, you know, these enterprise standards, but also balance that self-service agility to really get the best of both worlds because it's a changing world out there. So on that note, um, if anyone has seen uh, Dataversity and I put together uh, a survey just recently came out in October on trends in data architecture, but you know, as you'll see from our topics, data architecture is broadly related to a lot of different things, one of which is governance. So when we looked at the top reasons for why you're implementing your data architecture, or on the technical side, you'll see that some of the very top reasons were data governance, um, as well as 
things like self-service BI, digital business transformation, data science and discovery. So that almost is the summary of our abstract, right, that you have these things like governance and compliance, which you often think of as top-down rules and regulations. And then you have things like self-service BI and things like data discovery, which almost lead more to sort of freedom and expression and things like that. So how do, how do you balance both of those? Um, the oh, what complicates thing, but also is exciting, is this idea of, of more and more roles becoming interested in data. And I think that's a good thing. I remember, as Shannon mentioned, I'm old and I've been in the business for over 20 years. And I remember the old EDW conferences where sort of the, the common lament was the business doesn't care about data, no one cares about what we're doing, and it's sort of uh, be careful what you ask for. Because now everybody is interested in data, and that's a good thing. Um, but now we have to sort of create policies and tools and rules that can help everybody look at data. So when you look at the answer of who creates a data architecture, this isn't who creates reports. Um, this is who creates a data architecture. I mean, no surprise, the data architect <laughs> is almost a self-defining answer. But a lot of people now, from data scientists to business stakeholders um, to data governance officers to data ar uh, enterprise architects, programmers, you'll see that it isn't just uh, data architects doing it anymore. Just to clarify that question, it was a sort of show all that are responsible. So, so yes, I think if only. Um, I don't know, a data governance officer was only responsible for the architecture that might be nervous. Um, but it, what it should be, and I think the proper answer is, the data architect in conjunction with these other roles. And, and because everybody has an input and a need and a use case for a data architecture, which leads to governance. So in that case, I think that's an excellent trend. Um, we just have to make sure that we collaborate and we collaborate effectively because each of those roles needs to see and look at and control a different thing, especially when we start getting into the role of self-service um, you know, it, it might be a regular business user trying to write ports for, I don't know, for sales, um, and they're going to have a different uh, viewpoint than someone who's a data architect. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Nigel to kind of see how that applies to our topic at hand in terms of data modeling, governance, and quality. So Nigel? Hi. Uh, thanks, Donna, and hello, everybody, and uh, welcome from the UK, where I'm sitting as I'm doing this, and thanks for joining us. Um, Donna's just said that uh, collaboration is key if you're going to build an effective data architecture. Um, that means the roles, the various roles in the various data disciplines that, that are emerging need to work together as well. But of course, what that also means is that the different data disciplines, which traditionally sometimes have been seen as being fairly discrete, have to be applied together also in a very collaborative way. Um, we've entitled this webinar, Data Modeling, Data Governance, and Data Quality. And I think probably central to our contention is if you're going to get data architecture right, then you need to apply these three techniques um, in a very synergistic way um, to enable you to manage your data in any sort of strategic way. Uh, then this very simple diagram, this is what we try to illustrate here, I think, and you can see you can start pretty much anywhere in that diagram because it is, I think, a virtuous circle. But data modeling, as we know, identifies the key entities, the key attributes, for example, that means that that helps them to scope and prioritize where your focus should be in terms of improving the quality of that important data that you hold within your organization. Um, that in turn then, to make data quality happen and to make it a sustainable process, business process, you then need to implement data governance because governance basically puts the business in the lead for data quality improvement and also, of course, therefore, means that um, people in the business are there up front um, leading those efforts to, to make improvements happen. And then, of course, once you've got data governance in place, then that means that when you identify your key entities and attributes in your modeling activities, you can then start to identify who the owners of that data are and who the data steward should be, in turn, then, to drive up data quality. So we see these things, three things very much as being synergistic. And in terms of what each of them does, um, we spelt this out a little bit on the next slide. And I'm certainly not going to read this whole slide from end to end. You can read it for yourself. But I tried there to sort of indicate really what those three disciplines bring to this big picture. So I've already mentioned in data modeling, you know, mapping out the relationships, helping to scope and prioritize the data, identify those business people who may become stewards and owners. And I think also as well, I think we all know that a, that a well-produced clear data model is a very useful communication tool. And certainly in the last piece of work that Donna and I have been involved in in the UK, um, producing that communication tool was a great way of selling the need 
for a more strategic approach to data. It can also then, of course, help you to define some KPIs and metrics for some of your key data. Once you know the attributes, you can say, right, you know, what should the values of these attributes be? What should the accuracy of these things be? And then ultimately, as Donna said, the best data architecture in the world delivers nothing. Um, what, is, what you have to do is then translate that into real uh, data within real systems and real platforms and actually make the change that way. And data quality and some of its techniques and approaches also have great value here, of course. Um, data profiling is a very good way of baselining the current state of those key data entities that have been identified in the modeling activity. Um, doing that shows up to the business and to IT where some of the problems and some of the issues are. Um, obviously, then once you've identified what they are, they can help you to improve through data cleansing, data enrichment, and also sustain those gains by automating the application of those business rules in an operational environment. And of course, as well, an empirical foundation for KPIs and metrics. So if the models help you identify the KPIs, the, the data quality techniques help you to develop the foundation and the baseline, you can then set some realistic KPIs and metrics. And of course, as well, it gives you some real empirical information for building business cases. And then the, the way we see governance as well, and I'll come to this in a second, uh, it provides this overarching strategic framework within which these activities can take place. And obviously as well, it ensures the business leads on the definition of business rules and the definition of KPIs for data. Because after all, it's only the business that really know the importance of the, of, the, of the data and how good the quality of that data needs to be in order to meet the business need. Um, the other thing I think is really important about governance, and I'll come back to that later in the webinar, is the way that governance is a very good mechanism for actually uh, creating the cross business teams that you need to tackle end-to-end -end data problems and issues, and also, of course, then helping to actually present and deliver the business case. So th that's how we see the three things uh, interacting. In terms of the role of governance, um, Donna and I have uh, used this framework um, with a number of clients recently, uh, and it must be said very successfully. And if you're going to build an effective data governance framework, then it will really encapsulate and encompass some of the things I've been talking about. And the first thing you actually need is to be able to link your data architecture to your organization's goals and objectives. So you must be use it to answer questions like, well, how does the organization depend on data now? What data does it depend on critically? What data is it really important to get right? And how good is that data now? And also, of course, then to think about the business of the future. Uh, what does the business need to do in two years time or three years time that it can't currently do? And therefore, how does the data need to evolve to support that? And on the, on the right, you need, of course, to have a good understanding as well for your key data of what some of the key data issues and challenges are. As I mentioned earlier, you know, if you start with a very low baseline, uh, aiming for the sky is probably not going to be successful. So you have to be realistic about the goals that you set for yourself in the, in the program. And then, of course, you define the vision and strategy for what you're trying to do and sell that actively and communicate that into the business and IT and then create the necessary organization to make it happen, which would include people like data stewards and, and data owners and others. Um, devise the process and workflows that you need, um, set the KPIs and manage the data and measure it in, on a regular basis, and then change the culture of the organization so that data is seen very much at the heart of what it does. And then supporting all of that, as Donna said earlier, none of that happens unless you can Im implement that in the real world, and that's where tools and technology come into the picture. So there's a lot of areas there, I think, where both modeling and data quality play a big role. Just to mention data modeling, for example, that can help you define that vision and strategy because it gives you the data big picture that you need to start that process. Um, in terms of organization and people, identifies who the key stakeholders are for your data, helps to identify the key stakeholders for your data and therefore links them to the data to become potential data governance participants maps out the key data relationships, identifies the key data areas, and also I think from its communication value helps to build a data-centric uh, centric culture. And it also helps, of course, then to inform the investment in technology that you need to make. Um, in other words, that's the teeth that Donna talked about earlier. And uh, what's the end goal of all this? Well, I think this analogy always seems pretty appropriate to us. Um, many organizations, certainly that, I, that I've been involved in, have a culture where Reactive data improvement seems to be the norm and not the exception. In other words, they wait until the fire breaks out, 
They then create a fire brigade and they try and put the fire out. Um, but if you're going to manage data more strategically within a data architecture, data governance framework, the emphasis should really be on developing something that prevents the fires breaking out rather than waiting until they break out and then fixing them. So the main focus of data management people within that framework is therefore to prevent fires in a very proactive way. Um, I think it also illustrates one last point I'd like to make as well before I hand back to Donna. And the thing is about data improvement, um, I've often heard people say, well, we're far too busy firefighting to actually call the fire brigade in to teach us about how to get it right. The problem with that is that, of course, you're not making a choice of whether you're doing data improvement or you're not doing it. The choice you're making is, are you going to do it reactively and rather badly and inefficiently, or are you going to try and build something that will help you do it in a more systematic way and a way that avoids the problems rather than waits for them to happen? So data modeling is pretty key to all of that. So what I'll do now is hand you back to Donna, who will talk a little bit more about how data modeling can contribute to that picture. Donna? Yeah, and just to chime in on that point, the way I often say is if you don't have time to do it right, you have time to do it again, right? So you're going to spend the time. Let's just make it effective. <laughs> Um, which sort of ties into our idea of this, this data model and the beauty of a data model, and we talk a lot about com communication in this uh, presentation, because it really does translate your business rules and definitions to the technical systems, because governance is, is this my answer above, is it, is it business or is it IT? Yes, it's both. So, and most data models can have you both that conceptual and logical uh, model as well as the physical model that actually implements the systems and that's that nice connection or the teeth that a business person can very easily understand that you know we have a product uh, that a product is sold to a customer and then you can start getting questions like is a customer uh, the same as a client or is it different and so I, I kind of uh, made the point even a little more obvious by using pictures of things um, but I have literally done that in a data model, and some of the data modeling tools will let you uh, put a picture, and sometimes that's very important. I have a picture of a product, and that's a box, and they say, well, actually, no, we're selling insurance products, which are really more, maybe someone else would call that a service, or et cetera, et cetera. So it really makes clear what you're talking about. Um, I, I'm working for a large um, utility company and the idea of an asset. What's an asset? Is it part of the plant? Or is it a computer asset for asset management? You know, all those sorts of things. But when you put a picture of a truck versus a picture of a computer on the model, people immediately get what that thing is. Because as you've heard me say in the past, that that is really what a data model is. It's the things of the business and it's the rules around those things. And that very easily can then, if you say you're doing the top-down reverse engineering, create those technical structures and all the rules around it. And or, I always do both, um, you can do that bottom up of, of how do I understand the business? Well, start looking at the systems that are running it, right? And that's your physical data model. And you can learn volumes. Often there'll be a business process. You might have used a SAP system or a CRM type system and, and maybe it's not working for you. Well, often it's not working because it, the way the data is set up might not match your business process. Something as simple as I work with a customer, as simple as can a customer have more than one email address, right? And they wanted it to have two. Well, the system held it in an attribute, so you can only have one. And it caused wreak havoc on the business processes, um, but it was just a database design error or, or miscommunication. So that is the beauty of, of uh, having those rules. And then even within the technical systems, to a lot of folks, governance is just that. Do I have domains? Do I have naming standards? Do I have foreign key uh, constraints? Is my model in third normal form? That's a perfect form of governance. I mean, sometimes I get frustrated, or maybe it's a positive thing. Um, you know, something as simple as that support rep is putting in a list of states, um, and they're manually typing it in. Well, wouldn't that be great if we had a state code list, uh, state, state code list um, that sort of gave you an automated list, which, as we know, that's sort of a linking a table and having the right drop downs, right? So it's all in degree. You can't separate business from IT. Sometimes the business process could be supported by a better database structure, um, and sometimes the database structures are not correctly implementing or could be informed by business rules and definitions. So that's why they fit very nicely together. Um, and data models are hotter than ever. So um, we just did this survey that I mentioned in the beginning. Over 96% of folks who took the survey said they were doing data modeling of some sort. Uh, for those of you who say no one's doing data modeling anymore, you're wrong. <laughs> um, so this is the sexiest job of the 21st century. And I'm actually, as I said, I've been in the business forever, and data modeling sort of went out of style for a while. Um, and now we're seeing a massive upflux influx of demand, not only from business people, which is sort of the usually 
often uh, the, the first folks that ask. Um, and they'll ask for the word data model. Um, folks like data scientists, I want to know the rules behind the data. System developers, I, I like, need to understand what the business rules are to implement my system. So both tech and business um, both uh, can appreciate a, a data model. Um, because really that data model is that when we think of governance, right, and I had a client that did just this actually, you might have a policy or regulation, I use GDPR as an example, or it could just be something simple, we need to not share personally identifiable information or PII or PHI if, you know, if you're a um, healthcare company or student records if you're a school, right. That's nice to say, you can't share personal identifiable information, and some of it might be off, obvious, my name, it's probably, you know, but is it, what about my nickname, or what about my avatar, if I'm using an online program, right, or I'm a social media and I have a, you know, a meme, or not a meme, but, you know, my, my persona online, um, is that identifiable? So it isn't always obvious, that there's, there's fine lines. So what's nice about using metadata, which can be driven by a data model or a metadata tagging tools, et cetera, you can actually go down to the field level, and so when the developer is looking at this table, okay, this particular field is PII. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, it's situational based. But that's the beauty of a data model or metadata or, you know, whatever solution you're using is that there is this map of this actual field you're using that connects what legal might say <laughs> that you can't do um, or can do, uh, what your policy might say to actual the implementation that you're doing day to day. Um, you know, I think this is clear to a lot of folks in the call, but the beauty of this is tracking both technical metadata, you know, what tables and columns and what their data types are, to the definition of that, whether it's employee, is that someone that's worked with our company in the past six months or someone that works there currently, you know, a lot of subtleties in these business rules. And we're not going to forget that there's actually a John Smith out there. So especially when we're thinking of things like PII or PHI and GDPR, the whole purpose of that is to remember there's a human being behind this data, so please manage it, that data appropriately. Um, here's some more examples that you may have seen before, should be obvious, but what's you know, interesting is you can track things like data stewardship on a model. As Nigel mentioned, we've had a lot of uh, customers kind of have that aha moment for governance by starting with a model, um, because as you, any of you who have done data models, um, why we find them fun uh, is often that definition of what do I mean by a customer. And you say that to somebody who hasn't done this exercise and they say, are you serious? We're spending X amount of dollars to say what do we mean by a customer? <laughs> like open the dictionary, right? That's not hard. And then you start showing them the data model and they say, well, Marketing uses a customer for this for people who haven't bought the product, and then, well, support for them, a customer has to have an active support agreement, um, and we actually say a customer has to have an active account, but if we're reporting to the regulators, we actually should say the amount of people, you know, blah, 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 um, insert your business case here, and then that light bulb moment goes on, off, uh, with your light bulb, <laughs> whatever it happens with a light bulb. Um, and, and that starts to say, oh, exactly, then how are we going to manage this? Who would own that data? Who would... Well, exactly, and, and, and it never is black and white. People you might own the data for different use cases, and getting a governance team that people in process, Nigel was talking about, has to be the case, because what, what makes sense for a decision in one part of the model may not make sense to another group. So that's where data governance can come in. And it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a fight over it, it just says, I want to be aware that someone else has a different use case for that data. Um, I'm a big fan of this human metadata, this, this cultural knowledge of avoid the I just know, and a lot of us can do that. Are you serious? You want me to define a part number? Seriously, I just know that's the part number. But this, as anyone who has done data modeling for more than 10 minutes, you'll know, or implemented any system or done any application development, um, there's a lot of subtlety in those definitions. And it might be this gentleman who's about to retire. Oh, that used to be called component number. Oh, light bulb goes off. I didn't realize that. So that can be stored in the glossary, it can be stored in a metadata repository and or a data model, or as we'll talk later in this presentation, there's a lot of more self-service type collaboration tools. Again, a lot of the folks that know this stuff aren't on your data architecture team or on your database development team. They're the people doing this day to day. So as they start to do self-service BI, self-service data prep, that's where you're going to get these aha moments of, wait a minute, this data doesn't mesh. So letting these people speak for themselves, you don't have to have committees and, and go around and interview people, it just happens organically, is huge. That's not the only answer, uh, but as we'll hopefully explain later, it's a nice augmentation to the stuff you're already building in the model. You'll get probably even more information by letting these folks chime in and see and munge and, and play around with the data. 
Um, and I've shown this, this cartoon before, um, but hey, you have data modeling cartoons, you have to use them. Um, and it's, it's not funny, well, maybe it's just not funny, but it's not funny unless you've done this again in the business of, okay, we're all done with our acceptance testing, everything looks great, uh, we're gonna launch the application. This question, what is the customer again? <laughs> and as Nigel mentioned, trying to retrofit that after the fact, well, it might be job security for a lot of us, but it's not fun. You know, if we got this job done up front, we could be doing the cool stuff with this application and not reworking everything because we got the definition of customer wrong and we didn't get all business rules right. So get that up front um, before you have to go back and change things. Get Make sure everyone's in the room who might have a different opinion on how they use that customer data. Um, a big fan of if you have these definitions, glossaries are great, but a lot of modeling tools can actually show that definition in a model. And one of the reasons I like that, well, what's the difference between a customer and a client? Well, I can look at it right there. Uh, what do we mean by, what's the difference between a broker and a salesperson? Are they the same? So you can call it right out in the model um, so that business people or the people looking at it, technical developers who want the definition can see it right there. Um, and that's the beauty also of a data model is that it can kind of create both that business definition of what do I mean by customer and then link it with the reverse engineering on the technical side with that actual data inventory. Whether that, and this is, uh, if anyone is actually doing customer data out there, you'll say this is a tiny subset of what could be, but we have it on a SQL Server, an Oracle, and a SAP system. Um, if anyone's using an SAP or other CRM, I'm not just uh, picking on this one, one vendor, but uh, my little joke there is that it's a black box, right? Often those systems are so complex. Um, and to give them credit, they're complex because business processes are immensely complex. And their role is to create these business, you know, help your business processes be more efficient. Um, probably not goal one of, of making sure it matches with your glossary, right? So they, they just by nature are very complex. Um, order shipment, so you might be passing through XML, data lakes, your, your point of sale system uh, has its own data. So are they all integrated? And that's really what a data model can help link up. Um, to really get this goal that a lot of folks have, this idea of data lineage. So this may be a simplification. This is sort of the classic use case that everyone shows. I have a report and I have a, um, a figure on this report. Where did it come from? And this is kind of the classic case. It came from your source system. We did a staging area and we did a dimensional model or a, you know, or Inman model and, and we now have that in the warehouse. Um, and we see that lineage. Well, that's fine, that's super helpful, and that's where using some of these data models or modeling tools or metadata repositories, metadata is in these systems, you just often have to link them together, and a lot of tools are getting better at that. But then when we think of the, the new world and things like self-service, um, there may be other uh, things that we, we manipulate here. It could be done in an Excel spreadsheet. It could be development in AWS where we're, we're off putting things to the cloud or we're getting some end of things data and moving it, you know, to, from the cloud onto S3, onto the on-prem to do things with the warehouse and then sending it out to the lake. So it isn't obviously um, as clean as this. So using tools, um, whether they're self-service tools or data modeling tools, pick one that exposes its metadata, I guess is my, uh, because once the metadata behind those movements is there, you can create these lineages. So having done this at a lot of sites, it can be amazingly easy um, and it can be amazingly difficult kind of depending on how you're doing those movements. So it's often good to get the right tools and give that some thought um, of how we can get that out. Um, uh, I can move my own slides. Um, and this I like as a summary because that's the idea to me of that business meta, the business rules and policies around governance and then the technical metadata that really makes governance actionable. So it can take these business rules and define them into your technical implementations so you don't have developers wasting cycles trying to say, what do I mean by a customer? They can go to a published definition. Uh, vice versa, the technical implementations are clear to everybody and we don't have to argue about how many fields a account number is. I mean, I worked with a major brand name customer just recently where someone changed the account uh, part number from um, 11 characters to nine characters and brought a system down, right? I mean, this stuff happens. People are humans, um, and that was a pure data governance. We really shouldn't do that, change field names without letting people know field names, right? So that's the technical data standards. And then when you have that link, you can do that audit and lineage between what is PII and what data what database fields have it, or how did I get the figure on the report, right? So it's sort of the complete story uh, through metadata from your, your business uh, governance down to your technical implementation. Um, I'm gonna pack, pass back to Nigel to talk more about the data quality aspect. 
Yeah, thanks, Donna. I, I touched on the governance, the importance of the governance framework earlier. Donna's just, I think, uh, exposed very well the value of, of data modeling. So I thought it'd be worth just focusing briefly as well on the role data quality has to play in all of this. Um, and as Donna said, you know, ultimately this is all about making real data improvements within real systems. And this is where I think data quality has a key part to play in, in creating and maintaining data improvement within within the strategy that we're talking about. And why bother with data quality? Well, there's some fairly well-known statistics, I think. I'm not sure about the first one. Um, there are 2.5 quintillion grains of sand on the earth. If you don't know what a quintillion is, by the way, it's one followed by 18 zeros. And I know there are two and a half quintillion grains of sand on the earth because Donna got me to count them all. That's research for this webinar. And uh, when you compare that with the amount of data that's now being created every day, well, three times as much many bytes of data are being created every single day than the grains of sand on the earth. Nearly all of that has been created in the last two years. And that means that Moore's law is now being exceeded and data volumes double, which says they are every 1.2 years. I think now probably that figure is a couple of years out of date and it's probably now every about 10 or 11 months. So the bottom line of all this is if you don't have your data under control now and an understanding of how good and how fit for purpose that data is, it's only going to get worse. And in fact, it's probably going to get much worse. And um, just some recent evidence that uh, we've come across from, from a survey done by um, uh, Nagel, Redman and Salmon recently, published in the Harvard Business Review. I thought this was quite enlightening was uh, here's a piece of research where basically it's very simple me methodology. They, they asked 75 execs to identify an eyeball around 10 to 15 critical data attributes in 100 randomly selected data records from, from systems within their organization. And then they said, tell us how many of those records are error free. So in other words, all those 10 to 15 critical fields are actually fit for the business purpose for which they were intended. And the rather shocking conclusion from that was only 3% of those records were actually error free or contained less than 3% errors. So that is really weird. Um, it, both, it obviously goes to show again that, that unfortunately many organizations, poor data quality is the norm and not the exception. And the other thing I would say as well, there is a difference between legacy data and, and newly created data but only in the, to the extent that 47% of the newly created records that were examined were also error free. So it's a bigger problem the older the data becomes, which we'd expect anyway, because the normal rates of data decay, but it's not a problem that's being resolved by new data. And the impact of some of that on some of the things that we want to do in our data architectures, I think are demonstrated here. Um, the bottom left one, this is a, a fairly old piece of research now, but every piece of more recent research I've done displays this in not quite a, a significant way, but, but the US economy on itself loses over $3 trillion a year because of some of the issues with poor data quality. And it's not just in the traditional world that these things become a problem. And you'll see the other three um, facts that, that we, we've got from various recent surveys show that it's impacting the new world of data as well. So you're talking about data science and the analytics space and all the rest of it that you know, you, you, companies are employing very, very expensive data scientists, analytics specialists to do a lot, of this, um, a lot of this data analysis work. And in reality, what's happening is they're spending up to four days a week of their five day weeks doing nothing but doing some fairly basic data preparation and scrubbing activity before they can even start to, uh, to implement and start to gain some insight from the data that they're looking at. And um, I certainly come across a couple of companies where they do a lot of this stuff by literally by eyeballing it on spreadsheets. Um, there are much more efficient ways of doing it than that. It's, like, it's, it's akin, I would say, to you know trying to clean a dirty floor with a toothbrush. There are much more effective ways of doing it. And data preparation tools are something definitely such as operates, you, you know, are things that we're thinking about. So the scarce resources are not doing the job they're paid to do. So why are all these problems uh, in existence and why haven't companies sorted them out? Um, there's, I'm not going to go through this again in, in great detail, but this is why sometimes attempts to improve data through governance and quality actually do fall over. And one of the big things is the lack of business leadership and commitment. And um, there was a recent survey done in the UK, and it found that 23% uh, of the people they interviewed, they were mainly data management professionals, said that the biggest barrier they face was the lack of business leadership and commitment 
to data improvement and to creating data and sustaining data, data architectures. And, um, you know, it's quite a shocking statistic that there's still so many people in our businesses many of whom claim to be data-driven, who still don't get how important their role is in leading data improvement activities. And one or two others there as well, failure to focus on the data that really matters. If you boil the ocean, you'll fail. If you focus in on the key data that you know is important, which techniques like modeling can help you identify, you've got a chance of getting somewhere and having some success. Um, another thing I've noticed as well is that sometimes there's a lot of emphasis on data monitoring and not enough emphasis on actually improving the data. Monitoring data actually is a pointless exercise in itself because all you're doing is showing each month how bad your data is. Well, what the focus of governance and the focus certainly of data quality should be is, is demonstrating continuous data improvement. Um, and then finally as well, I think as well that, that you know, it's, this is a culture change and therefore some of the techniques of governance, some of the, te some of the, um, the artifacts that models, data models uh, generate, must embrace everybody who uses data across an organization. It's not just the data management experts that need to be educated. It's pretty much everybody across the organization. So there's a lot of reasons there why it's quite hard to do this stuff. The second reason why it's quite hard to do this stuff is because, of course, data rather sort of inconveniently doesn't follow normal, um, normal organizational structures. And um, what the next slide shows very simply is that, as we all know this, if you're going to succeed in solving problems with customer data, you cannot do that within the sales department or within the finance department. What it, what it requires is for those departments to work collaboratively together. And that includes the business people in those departments, the process owners, the IT specialists in those areas, and also the subject matter experts for data in those areas. Because you know, effective data management, data quality improvement, requires the organization to work collaboratively and horizontally across the organization to solve the end-to-end -end problem. Um, I've had lots of examples of this in my experience, certainly in doing that. And on the next slide, I will uh, demonstrate why these things happen. And many of you are familiar with this. It's normally called, uh, this little executive toy is normally called Newton's Cradle, named, of course, after the famous uh, English scientist Sir Isaac Newton. It's also called Newton's Balls. But I think Newton's cradle sounds a little more dignified, personally. And if you take the example of earlier of the customer data, I, I came across, I've come across several examples in several companies where the, the quality problem is really caused the data input. It's, you know, a client either rings or has their, has their uh, online application processed by some sort of front end marketing sales department. They are not as careful as they might be about capturing all the customer's details correctly, and they feed it into the system job done. And it's really only much further away in the organization, in the customer life cycle, where some of those problems start to emerge. I mean, the best example I can give from my own experience is that uh, when I worked in BT, our front end staff were not very good at capturing customers' addresses. So when the customer ordered a product like broadband, um, addresses were sometimes hastily scribbled down because the people at the front end were more concerned with getting on with the next call than they were to capturing the data correctly. Um, given Newton's cradle, what was happening there, they didn't really feel the impact of that. But when the guy in the van went out to try and install the equipment in the customer's house, on a disturbingly large number of occasions, because the address was poorly recorded, that, 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 that engineer in that van could not find that address. Uh, that was really, of course, a badly impacted the customer experience, it wasted engineers' time, and of course it wasted money for, for BT at the time. So it was only by getting the engineering workforce and the, uh, and the salespeople to work together to solve the problem did we get a resolution of that. So collaboration is most definitely all. And so where, what's the sweet spot of all of this then? We're bringing back to the theme of data modeling, data quality, and data governance again. So again, what we're trying to demonstrate here is that these three disciplines need to work in harmony together. Uh, you identify your core data through your modeling activities. You ensure that it's, that it's properly owned and stewarded through data governance processes. And then you use data quality techniques to focus on improving that data. And that's what I would certainly call the core data sweet spot. And this can then deliver real and substantive benefits to an organization. But that doesn't imply either, finally, that all data is equal. And this is where I think we come back to some of the new uses of data in the big data world and in the analytics world and in data science, that not all data is equal. 
um, we, we've developed this pyramid, which we think is quite a useful way to demonstrate that what you need to do in organizations is do just enough data governance. So the top layer of that pyramid, the reference and master data, we'd expect to be in any organization, I think would expect that to be very rigorously, tightly controlled with clear owners, uh, with clear data stewards and with clear plans for data improvement and data management. And um, in many cases, you know, what's the threshold for quality for that? Probably needs to be as damn near to 100% as you can possibly make it. And then moving down to sort of core enterprise data, which is not necessarily master or reference data, but they could be things like uh, financial transaction records, for example. Then again, the quality of that data needs to be pretty high and therefore it needs to be pr pretty highly governed and, uh, and pretty carefully controlled. Functional operational data at the third level, a lighter touch is probably good enough for that. Um, because simply because the volumes of data begin to grow and increase. And at the bottom in the area where analytics really is, um, a lot of that stuff demands the lightest touch of all. Some policies need to be adhered to, um, but basically it doesn't have to be controlled anywhere near as rigorously as the data in the top three levels. So in other words, your, your, your solution needs to be proportionate to the problem. So what I'll do at that point is hand you back to Donna to talk a more about those bottom layers, the rise of sort of BI analytics and data preparation. Donna. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, as, as Nigel mentioned, I mean, there's certain things in the organization like master data, like reference data that should be very closely monitored, very closely modeled. You should, I, you should have a data model. If someone asks a question in the, in the comments, where does the MDM fit? You know, this is one place where it does fit. And you should definitely have a data model for MDM. You should definitely have data governance for MDM. You should definitely be tracking the data quality for every master data element very, very closely, right? But what I've seen some companies do is take that a little too far. And, and then, you know, uh, we've been very lucky that all of the data governance projects that we've been working on in the past few years, people have been asking for the business. People have loved it and because they understand, like, the effort um, that Nigel mentioned, if we have the address wrong, we're trying to send someone out in a truck, they're going to go to the wrong spot. You know, it's just obvious that we should have data governance. Where you get the people rolling their eyes and not loving data governance so much, I think is when people take that too far. And, and as Nigel mentioned, getting that sweet spot of what to manage very closely and what to leave alone is, is critical to your success of data governance. So everyone should be looking at the same core list of vendors, if that's what we're mastering. Um, but when someone's trying to do some exploratory self-service analytics, leave them alone, right? So yes, they should be using the core established reference and master data, um, but if I'm trying to download some weather patterns from um, some open source and, and do some exploration, don't over-govern that. At the same point, of course, I think it's obvious the point we've made, don't under-govern your master data, um, but I think the point that needs to be made a little more strongly is this idea of the rise of self-service BI, analytics data prep. So if you think back to earlier in the presentation, all of those different roles. So not everybody, a lot of people when you get master data right, for example, because that question came up, I don't even know that there's master data. I just know that my point of sale system, the list of menu items um, on my menu is correct, right? Because someone has mastered that in the background. When you get it right, people don't notice. That's the beauty of it, right? Or the address is right because we have the right master data for customer. Um, uh, but uh, so that works for the standard data. But what are these sort of non-standard? So a, it may not be relational. I might be um, getting some Internet of Things or social media sentiment analysis or you know open source data sets I want to integrate or Google Maps, all this different kind of thing. How do we handle that? So if you think of this new type of user that we're seeing more and more of uh, for many reasons, part of it is I'll go back to my previous slide. Several reasons. One is the tools are just slick. <laughs> I mean, what, what folks had to do before, I mean, I'll go way back on the mainframe, right, to, to just integrate two data sets, but you get something like some of these self-service data prep tools, it's just very easy to integrate some of the data and manipulate it and report on it. So, you know, there's self-service data prep and then there's self-service BI, and both of those tools have some very nice things. The accessibility of data, as I mentioned, the, the amount of data you can just download off the web from scientific research um, and integrate on your own and do some cool reports, even things like R, you know, or Python, is amazing, right? And I, I think there's two things. A, the tools are easier for business users, but business users themselves are a lot more tech savvy. And, and I, I sort of, even though we're all using it, I, I sort of hate that term 
business and IT, like they're two completely different things. And, and you know, IT is part of the business, and, and we sort of make the assumption that anyone who's in business couldn't possibly understand technology and, and, and data structures, and of course they do. I think of folks in science, finance. Um, you know, some of the best data scientists I know, or maybe came from other, you know, scientific roles that are business or finance that is business, right? Um, so this new type of user is very savvy, um, and she loves to live in both worlds. So it's not an either or. Um, so uh, one of the business authors wrote a book, and one of the quotes I liked was that, that wait a minute. The beauty of and and the tyranny of or. I think we like to create these false dichotomies that you either have data models or you have self-serve and, and those are two camps and they don't live together. They certainly live together. So this type of person that's doing analytics um, and self-service data prep, of course, if there's published definitions that are right, um, and I can just get the list of customers and their current address, thank you very much. Because if you think back to the statistics that Nigel showed, you know, this lady's probably spending four days out of her five that she has to do work just cleaning up bad data. And she wants to make discoveries from it, right? So, yes, if there's standard master data, if there's standard glossaries to know what this data means, if anyone saw my, I think it was February, where I did a business intelligence webinar where I did that myself. I downloaded some open source data, got one of these new BI tools um, that's slick to use and tried to report on it, but there was no metadata from this open source data set, so I had no idea what those columns meant. And, and that's what a lot of people see when they start looking at some of this enterprise data. What, you know, what does this date mean and, and how is the context, right? So those people love the stuff we just talked about, but they also want to be able to do some self-service. I want to take those standard data sets and integrate it in myself to do some exploring and analysis and modeling, the other kind of modeling, right? I'm doing some statistical modeling and some you know, data visualizations and, and all this exciting stuff. And she has a lot of stuff in her head um, that she'd love to share. So I, I see this as slightly different from what, we, and they're integrated, and, and we could argue all day of where that fine line mixes, because some of the metadata tools are becoming more collaborative, and some of the collaboration tools are becoming more governance focused. Um, so there is a, a, a merging uh, line there. Um, but they have a lot of information in their head that they should share, that it isn't just living in the data architecture team. Um, so there's this, I, I kind of see two worlds here. Um, I kind of said the encyclopedia versus Wikipedia, right? So in the encyclopedia world, it was a few academics that sat in a, a closed room, and this is the definition, and thou shalt um, consume this truth. Um, that has a place. I think if we're talking about those standardized enterprise data sets, yes, those should be locked down. It, it shouldn't be just a few people in the room. It should be the right people in the room from all of the different areas of the business. But then, yes, that's, that by definition is sort of the encyclopedia approach. But there's also the Wikipedia approach, and I'm old enough to know when that got, <laughs> I think hopefully some of us on the call were, um, of when that first came out. And there's a lot, still a lot of skepticism. Um, how can that be right? It's just a bunch of people editing stuff. But if you look at it, it can often be very helpful. It's that idea of sort of eventual consistency, that if enough eyes look on this, we'll eventually find a better source of truth by this constant effort. And I think that's almost the beauty and the definition of this idea of self-service data prep, self-service data governance and analytics, um, and, and in some ways is a, is a different um, viewpoint. So what a lot of these tools uh, offer is this idea of harnessing tribal knowledge, right? So um, if you think of it, so that lady who's writing the queries, um, she might have, it almost gets back to the classic definition of, uh, I've seen people argue, you know, what is the definition of customer and what is the definition of total sales, right? Or, and it depends, and you can't, and it depends in a good way, right? So what you might be reporting to the street versus what you're using for forecasting, right? And so if you, you publish these, these queries and see who else is using it, oh, the sales team uses this, um, and there's six queries out there, but the one that everyone's using for reporting is this one. That speaks volumes, or you are reverse, I had a customer that reverse engineered one of those ERP uh, CRM systems, and they are daunting. So what he did, and said, what tables are people actually hitting? That's how I found out. <laughs> and again, it's not a perfect truth, but nothing's a perfect truth. What are the glossary terms that everyone's looking at? You know, so that kind of usage ranking can speak volumes. Helpfulness ranking, which especially when we're doing things like sharing definitions, sharing algorithms um, for my models, sharing queries. Um, again, what is the query of total sales that is, you can, you can say thou shalt, right, and that has a place, but often the devil's in the details of what people are actually using. So a lot of these, you know, tools can actually have that helpfulness ranking, uh, the usage ranking, 
And then what I think a lot of the value is, is this idea of collaboration and crowdsourcing. So if you think back to the example earlier that, um, you know, part number used to be called component number before the acquisition. So that guy's now, he has this little avatar, right? So he's gone to the new world. Um, and he sees this definition, and you can have alternate names. That's fine. It used to be component number, but it says it's an eight-digit alphanumeric field. Um, and he says this, this used to be a, a ten-digit field. You know, it didn't have letters. What's wrong? Um, and this other lady jumps in. Yeah, no, no, it's the same thing. I had the same problem. We actually have a program that parses it out and converts it. Click here, and you can get a copy of it. Awesome, right? So either in, if we just did the encyclopedia approach, you would have either forced a definition on folks or maybe the definition is right but people didn't have the context. And even better, this lady has a solution that you can link to because um, she's been in the data and been doing self-serve and, and, and this is the beauty of that collaboration and crowdsourcing. And maybe she's in London and, and he's in Helsinki and they never would have met. Um, and so that beauty of being able to get that collective knowledge through these tribal knowledge is really the best of both worlds. So again, I don't want to say it's an and and an or between the encyclopedia and Wikipedia. You know, often you do have the standard definition out there, but just let people comment on it. And that's the beauty of, of both worlds, of really getting that information that you might not have found before. Uh, so to sort of start summarizing, it is a balance. So in the modern data landscape, there are certain areas of your data, again, uh, data standards, reference data, master data, that really should be based on these data models and standards and steering committees and formal, really strict governance. And then there's also this idea of the collaboration and based governance, where you have your self-service data prep, you're doing analytics, you're doing discovery, and some of that discovery can feed back into your standards base. Wow, we found that if we track social media um, accounts for our customers, we really can get better sentiment. So we can we add that to our master data. And that's the beauty of both worlds, that you really get that superset of working the two well together. So. A, don't ignore both sides. Don't say, oh, those people doing self-serve, oh, they shouldn't be. We're going to lock that down. Oh, of course they should be, right? <laughs> this is their job. They're doing discovery. Um, so give them the standards they could. Listen to what they're saying. And um, on the self-service side, don't say, oh, those people, these old school people doing models, they're so old school. Why do you do that anymore? Maybe look at some of the standards. You know, who, who gets excited? Well, maybe some of us on the call gets excited about country code lists and things like that, right? Um, but if they've already solved some of those problems, use what they've developed. So again, that's, I think, the beauty of, of this both self-serve model and more of the, the governed, uh, strongly governed top-down, which goes back to this pyramid that we mentioned, know what to govern in what way. Um, to summarize so that we can open it up to questions, because I know we're getting close to the time, um, data governance is yeah, it's the yes, right? It's the all of the above. It is the people, it is the process, it is the tools, um, and then picking those tools and technologies to fit the right use case. So am I crowdsourcing some metadata for my, my analytics queries and the, and the data, um, you know, preparation around that, or am I locking down for my more structured master data type information? Um, so just quickly before we open it up for questions, uh, this is us, Nigel and I do this for a living, so if you need help, let us know. We have offices both in the UK and US and can help you worldwide. Um, hopefully uh, you guys can join us for some of our events next year. We're really excited about the new broader focus. Um, I was with Shannon in Chicago a few weeks ago at the Data Architecture Summit and had a lot of just, the excitement was really nice to see all of the new things that are being done in data architecture that we can hopefully hit on. Um, just quickly, those two papers I mentioned, um, we have a, tre a trends in data architecture. We also have last year, but it's still relevant, um, uh, trends in metadata management. They are both available both on dataversity.net and our global data strategy. Pick your, pick your pleasure, um, and, and you might find some interesting things there. So at this point, Shannon, we can open it up for Q&A. Donna and Nigel, thank you so much. I love it. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged. I love the chat that's going on, too. So uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending out uh, a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Thursday. I almost said Monday because I'm used to the webinar being on Thursday. By end of day Thursday <laughs> with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session and anything else requested throughout. Um, so lots of questions going on here. So. I'm just going to start right with the one that I'm looking at immediately. How do you differentiate data, data catalog from metadata? The reason I ask is because the vendors are muddying the waters in this space. Um, I'll take that first, um, and Nigel, if you want to chime in. 
I, there's always muddy waters in all of these spaces, and, and part of it is, is legit in, in that there is a sort of a fine line. How I see some of these data catalogs um, is often more on, if we think of the Wikipedia versus in fact, they're more on that Wikipedia side, and it more is this tribal knowledge, um, where often they're cataloging kind of for some of these um, analytics. Um, and, and just take a look when you're looking at the tool, a lot of good tools for different sources. A lot of them are really aimed at these bus business analytics, um, self-service type folks. And if that's what you're doing a lot of, they're awesome. Um, more of the metadata repository type is often that more enterprise-wide, more set to some of what we were talking about earlier on the call of I'm trying to get my data model and my relational databases in, in more of the um, traditional enterprise-wide structured metadata repository. And we can go on, what's that difference between that and a data dictionary and a glossary? You know, there, there is some overlap, um, but I would maybe just, uh, often I hear the word used as that, um, how I describe, but just, just ask the next leading question to the vendor in terms of what their use cases are and where their scope are is, and see if it matches your use case. Because, you know, I've seen people go both ways. I've seen um, customers try to get the enterprise-wide repository when they really just needed the cataloging tool, and they were frustrated. It's almost back to our pyramid. And I've seen people try to do full enterprise-wide repositories with a, one of these cataloging tools and it just wasn't meeting their use case. So I, I would just skip back the names and, <laughs> and see what the functionality is and see if it misses your needs, matches your needs. Nigel, any other thoughts on that? Or? No, I have nothing to add to that, Don. I think that's a pretty accurate picture of where things stand, yeah. Um, okay. So, Donovan, can you go back over the light bulb going on and off? <laughs> um, I, I probably was stream of consciousness there. When was I talking about the light bulb? Um, oh, I think the light bulb moment I was talking about um, was when we were talking about data models. Um, and actually, I had one of those light bulbs go on this week um, where where the person um, actually asked that they, we don't we steer away from data governance. Um, that it was too unwieldy and it just took too long. Um, and we focused first on the data model because there was a realization that we just needed some of those business rules. And then when you started to look at the data model, maybe this one that I'm showing now is an example of, well, one group calls it customer and one group calls it client and can we make those the same and what's the difference between, we started to see the overlap. Um, you know, my analogy I use a lot that's probably overused but it works is, you know, the, the seven men looking at an elephant and one looks at the tail and they think it looks like a rope and one's looking at the legs and it looks like a tree and one looks at the trunk and it looks like a snake and they're all right. And when you try to explain that to sometimes a, a sponsor in terms of the governance, it just seems so academic. Seriously, you people are up in a room and arguing about that. And then you start to show the, the actual model or, or process flow diagrams or any enterprise architecture, and they start to see those groups that are conflicting, and that's the light bulb that goes off. Ah, so how are you going to manage those conflicts and how data is used in different ways? And then they sort of get the need for governance because that governance is getting to that superset of the definitions. I think that was my light bulb comment. Yeah. Anything else, Nigel, on that? Or? No, I mean, the other bit of light bulb, I think, with, with the client we worked with earlier this year, Donna, as well, was, was they were trying to develop data standards and really were struggling as to which data standards to develop and why. And it wasn't until that we produced, I think, the conceptual model and then at a lower level, certain areas, logical data models, that they began to understand where they needed um, things what they call control lists, which we would regard as reference data lists, and also where they needed data standards because these were these were areas of data within the organization that were pretty much universally used. So it would be the top end of that pyramid, if you like, was where they needed to really focus their efforts. And I think we, from that, they had a light bulb moment and suddenly realized, aha, that's how we decide what future data standards we need to build. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I think we have time for one more question here. Um, so how do you measure your governance framework uh, is progressing? What kind of KPIs are you recommending to know that uh, you're being successful? I'll let you well, get that one, Nigel. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have a go at that, Donna. I mean, well, obviously, you know, what you're doing here is, is when you create a data governance framework, you, what you're trying to build is a, is a plan for improving data. And like any plan, it needs to have uh, tasks and owners and deliverables. So many of the many of the things that you measure in terms of success are KPIs in terms of, you know, did we meet the deliverable dates? Have we delivered this deliverable when we said we would? 
how many, and then some of them are quantitative. So they might be things like, you know, we've identified we need 17 data stewards in these key data areas. How many of them are currently in place? Um, you know, how many did we say we have in place at this point? And then, of course, more, you know, from the more data quality perspective, you can then start to think about a bit like the uh, the Harvard re uh, review that I mentioned earlier. You know, how many of our data records are now fit for purpose? Um, how many, what percentage of them aren't? And therefore, what you're trying to demonstrate for so using things like dashboards in those areas are um, how to, uh, you know, are, are how to show continuous improvement so that the governance that you're delivering and the data quality improvement that, that, that results from that is actually uh, generating real business benefits. The one thing I would say about that is when you're measuring data specifically is trying somehow to connect that to the business drivers because saying that, you know, Donna mentioned addresses earlier on. In BT, when we did that piece of work that I talked about earlier, you know, we were, we reckoned that the current, the, 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 the accuracy of addresses when we first looked at them was, I don't know, around 80%. I make these numbers up, it was quite a while ago. And what we wanted to do was drive that accuracy, accuracy up to 90%. So, you know, every month we would, we would, we would, put those addresses through a data profiling tool, put some basic rules around it, and then produce some reports. So you could actually demonstrate then, you know, month on month that we were actually making a difference and making it better. But at the same time, what we were doing was then we, we, we came up with a figure, and uh, it's too long to go into the explanation as to how we did that, as to what a bad address was costing the company. So that we could only, that therefore we could translate that improvement in data to reduction in what we call the cost of failure. So it's very important, whatever you can, to try and put some sort of financial value on data improvement. Yeah, I'll just add one quick thing to that, if you'll let me, just quickly. Um, on, on the idea of the pyramid, is to touch on what Nigel said, is we all start with those few KPIs around the few data elements that everyone's using, and then if you can tie it, so an obvious one might be customer email address. Can we get that 99% right? And then the, some of those you can easily tie to a business KPI. If we get 99% of our emails right, our marketing campaign effectiveness might increase by 5%. So aligning some of your technical quality KPIs with your business KPIs is a really nice way to show value of your governance down the road. Well, that does bring us just past the hour. Donna and Nigel, thank you so much. Nigel, thanks for joining us this month. And Donna, thanks as always for another great presentation. Just love it, a fantastic topic. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we do. I just love all the questions. So sorry to have time to get to all of them today. But again, as Donna mentioned, we will be changing up the series and broadening the scope a bit of the series topic to data architecture strategies. We hope you'll join us next month for that. You'll be seeing the links for that soon. And I hope everyone has a great day. Happy Thank holiday. You. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Cheers.